Welcome fellow Stardust. Are you ready for a scare? I see you've come back for more. If you're new here, buckle up. And thank you for joining me today. My name is DeRay, aka Rainbow Fright, lover of all things dark, creepy, and weird. And for today's video, I'll be ringing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. So last Saturday, I uploaded my ride-along review of the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. And I'll leave a link for that video down in the description, but because it was released to VOD onto Netflix, I went ahead and shot the video at my house, even though it was still my initial reactions and unscripted. So after having watched nine TCM movies, I thought I might as well do my first ranking video. And if y'all enjoy this one, let me know. That way I can go ahead and throw these kinds of videos into my rotation. And before we get started, I wanted to let you know that my review for this week will be uploaded tomorrow. I know you guys might have been expecting it today, but I went ahead and shifted things back a day this week because this Saturday I'll be attending a virtual screening with the Monster Fam in the Mutant Theater in the Discord chat room. I've been asked to pick two movies for this month's Saturday afternoon double feature, and my choices were The Machinist and Bad Milo. And after Bad Milo is finished, I'll be premiering my review of the film. So if you'd like to join us tomorrow, just look for the Discord link down in the description or the Monster Fam website link. So as far as ranking all of the movies, I'll go ahead and start with the worst film first and work my way up to the best. And along the way, I'll give them each a rating. Some films will end up with the same rating, but one will have the edge over the other, but doesn't necessarily deserve a higher rating. Now, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise is an interesting one because we have nine different movies, five storylines, two prequels, and one remake. The filmmakers kept failing at breathing life back into this franchise even though each film brought in a profit at the box office, except for The Next Generation, which was the only film to lose money for the franchise. The late and great Toby Hooper passed away in 2017 and was the writer, director, and producer of the iconic original film. He also had Kim Hinkle help him with the writing of the script. Kim Hinkle would go on to produce many of the installments along with Toby Hooper. Toby produced almost all of the films except for three, four, and this last one, nine. This film is what made him famous after 10 years of filmmaking and would change the slasher genre forever. He would also go on to direct Poltergeist. Now before watching all of these films in preparation for the new film, I had only seen one, two, and five. Now I've got some unpopular opinions about a few of these films, so I'm super excited to hear what all of y'all think. So leave your list in the comments or at least give me your top three TC films. All right, let's jump into it. So my least favorite movie in the franchise is Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. This one was released in 1995 and stars Renee Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey, who were budding actors at the time. In this film, we have some teenagers who leave prom and get into a car crash in the woods, only to be met by the Sawyer family and their lackey. Darla. This family isn't cannibalistic, but instead they like to stuff their victims' bodies and eat pizza. It's discovered that they are in cahoots with the Illuminati. This film has the worst low effort leather face of the entire franchise. He's not scary, his teeth aren't messed up, and his mask looks cheap and not like human skin. Just terrible in so many ways. The entire franchise takes things from different movies, which is kind of fun to observe because we have so many directors and writers and producers, with Toby and or Kim usually producing on the film. A few examples in this particular installment are Running Through the Woods, The Lead Girl Jumping Through the Window, and the freezer hook scene in the first film. 
We've also got a mechanical leg, but instead of it being on Leatherface, it's on Vilmer. I was excited to watch this fourth installment because Kim Hinkle had directed and wrote it, and he hadn't been involved in the franchise since the first film. But unfortunately, it just didn't cut it for me. Both Matthew and Renee gave really great performances, and Matthew might seem a bit over the top at times, but he was genuinely creepy and just freaked me out from time to time and he really carried the whole film. We no longer have a family who is cannibalistic, instead they now eat pizza. And this is actually another callback to the third film because Benny asks the family, well haven't you heard of pizza in response to them complaining about being hungry. And we've also got this Illuminati thing that's never fully explained and doesn't really make sense. And another confusing moment at the end of the film is when Jenny makes eye contact with Sally, the final girl from the original film. Why did they lock eyes and how would she know who she was from 20 years prior? It just didn't make any sense. It seems as though Kim was trying to make fun of himself and the entire franchise and he accomplishes this but it doesn't really come off as a campy comedy horror film. And we don't even get a chainsaw kill. So, Next Generation gets a 2 Rainbow Skulls out of 5. At number 8 is The Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Beginning, the sixth installment released in 2006. This was a prequel to the fifth installment. The fifth installment was a full remake with Jessica Biel. When this one started, I was really excited to go back to 1939. I really wish they would have stayed in the 40s or maybe even early 50s. That way we could get a really good look at what shaped Leatherface. Although I know some people like it when the serial killer has no rhyme or reason for his killing sprees, but when they have motive, it can be just as scary. Like with Freddy, and Candyman. In this origin story, Leatherface's mother died while giving birth to him at work, and he was disposed of in a dumpster by her manager. Years later, two couples, two of which are brothers, are traveling across country to enlist in the Vietnam War. On their way, they get into a car accident and become prey to the cannibalistic Hewitt family. The producing team included Toby Hooper, Kim Hinkle, Michael Bay, and several others. It was written by Sheldon Turner and directed by Jonathan Liebsman. This one has some really great cinematography. We finally got some of that grittiness that we had in the first film that made it feel so real. We don't get too much of the documentary style shooting like in the first one, but we get little moments of it here and there, especially when they're driving around and during bloody and violent scenes. And this installment was probably the bloodiest yet, and I loved it. We get a really fun backstory to Monty's double amputation, and the face removal was probably the best in the franchise. Even though I am a gore hound, I can still appreciate a film that shows restraint with blood and guts and can still creep me out without too much of it, like in the original film. Toby Hooper even tried to get a PG rating for the first film because of how little blood we do see. But there there was no way that was going to happen, regardless of there being very little shown on camera. Other examples of films that can creep you out without showing you too much blood would be Would You Rather, Circle, and 1408. The actors for this film were decent. The cast includes Jordana Brewster, Matt Balmer, and R. Lee Ermey. Andrew Bernarski played Leatherface in both the fifth and sixth installments, and he gave me OG Leatherface vibe, mostly in this installment and not so much in the fifth. He was big and hulking, but was still very sensitive. So while a prequel might seem like a good idea for a franchise or a movie, it can be difficult to surprise your audience because they already know who's going to be around based on the previously released movie, which is why I like it when a prequel is set as far back as possible. But these two movies take place within about four years of each other. So for me, unless a third film is planned, you should use prequels very sparingly. So for instance, if you have an original film and then you do the prequel, then the third film should be ready to go that takes place after the very first film. That way it all ties together. Despite all the things I liked about this film, there was just too much that happened that didn't sit well with me. Leatherface's hook grab was impossible, character reactions seemed far-fetched at times, and why would Leatherface drive off in the truck at the end? 
I know it's to give the audience a glimmer of false hope, but a deranged killer would have killed her as soon as she got into the car. All in all, we get the same story over again, but with more graphic scenes throughout the film. And I get taken out of the world constantly because of the bad character decisions. And it's hard to be surprised because we already know what the ending is going to be. The beginning earns two and a half rainbow skulls. At number 7 is the second installment, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, the very first sequel, released in 1986, 12 years after the first film. This one was directed and produced by Toby Hooper, and he left the writing to L.M. Kit Carson. Toby initially wanted to hire a director, but he couldn't find one within their budget, and he took this one into a completely different direction and made it into a campy black comedy. This story follows Stretch. A radio DJ who heard and recorded Leatherface's latest attack. Lefty, uncle of Sally and Franklin, knows that Leatherface is the culprit when he arrives to the scene and vows to get justice for his brother and their family. Lefty convinces Stretch to play the tape on the radio in order to lure the murdering family to her, which he's successful at, but they almost kill Stretch. Stretch is spared by Leatherface for some reason and she ends up in their underground home and we get a bunch of events that go down as Lefty makes his way through the house. This one stars Bill Mosley, Caroline Williams, Dennis Hopper, and Jim Siddell. Being a Texas Chainsaw Massacre fan back in 1986 and waiting for this sequel, I would have been massively disappointed like many fans were. Even the production company was expecting another horror film, but Toby was dead set on delivering this black comedy. I'm guessing this is because black comedies and comedy horror films were becoming really popular in the 80s and he wanted to jump on that bandwagon. But the trailer doesn't warn audiences that it's not going to be a horror. If you had a keen eye, you'd notice that this movie poster is a spoof on The Breakfast Club and might second guess what this movie is going to be like. This movie does have some good moments, including Nasty Old Chopped Up. I wanted to rate this movie a little bit higher just because of him, but it wasn't enough. That scratch and eating of the scalp reveal is so disgusting and so good every time. The opening scene is fun and catches our attention right away because everything is modernized. We've got a car phone, some hip music, and funky clothes with other elements that are opposite of the previous film, such as Major Rose and the lack of isolation with the first kill happening on the radio waves instead of in complete isolation. This film kicks off the little nods to the previous films with various callbacks that all subsequent films do throughout the franchise. There are nods to other horror movies outside of the franchise, for instance Psycho when Stretch is following the family to their home. Just like in the original TCM, we get Grandpa again in the third act, along with the family dinner and the cutting of the final girl's back with a razor. Overall, this movie is fun. You will chuckle from time to time and you'll be grossed out, but you'll never be scared. A bunch of stuff happens that makes you say, why? Okay already? Still? And some stuff is just really repetitive and the pacing starts to slow down in the second act and doesn't really pick up toward the end, which is strangely unsatisfying. And this leather face was a little bit too loose and goofy for my taste, but I guess that was Toby Hooper's goal. It's too bad that they couldn't get the original leather face Gunnar Hansen to be in this second film, but he apparently was wanting a bit of a higher pay than what they were offering him. And after a really grueling shoot on the first set, he wasn't going to sell himself short. I also didn't understand what was so special about Stretch and what made Leatherface sympathize with her or lust for her after all of these years of not having those kinds of emotions. So this installment also gets two and a half rainbow skulls, but it's just a hair more entertaining than the sixth installment. My number six slot goes to the new movie, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2022, directed by David Blue Garcia. The only other Texan to direct an installment aside from Toby and Kim. Chris Thomas Devlin was the writer and Kim Hinkle and Ian Hinkle were the producers along with four other people. It stars Sarah Yarkin, Elsie Fisher, Jacob Lattimore, and Mark Burnham as Leatherface. 
My review of this film was available last Saturday, so I'll leave a link up here and down in the description so you can check that out. In this one, we follow a group of young people to Harlow, Texas, a small deserted town they plan to bring back to life with their restaurant and the businesses of their investors. They find that Leatherface and his mama haven't vacated their home yet, and they go and get the police. All of the commotion causes the old woman to have a heart attack and she dies. This triggers Leatherface and sets him off on his killing spree. This installment is a direct sequel to the first film, the fifth in the franchise, and it's also a bit of a reboot because we have some things going on that can't be explained by the first film, which is a bit distracting at times because I was trying to put some pieces back together that wouldn't fit knowing that Sally from the first film was also going to be returning. Unfortunately, I felt like bringing back Sally was a bit of a waste. She didn't add anything to the story, and when we finally got her on screen with Leatherface, she dies almost immediately. Her decisions were dumb, Leatherface not shooting her right away didn't make sense, and her surviving a chainsaw attack was the last straw with her character. We had an annoying group of friends who we don't learn much about, which made their deaths that much more satisfying. The gun violence awareness is appreciated, I just don't think it can really be received with a film like this. It felt a bit out of place. Because of that and the lack of details, Lila's backstory isn't as impactful as it should be. We get some really creative and bloody kills. I was excited for every kill scene. They all made me jump and giddy with excitement. And the sound mixing stood out to me and the cinematography was on point. And all of the actors were great. One thing that I think brought the film down that I didn't mention in my review was the setting. It was a bit too empty even though it was supposed to be deserted. It just looked like a straight up movie set. There would be at least some people around since Richter is there with his shop and the woman lived there in the house with Leatherface and had to have been getting groceries from somewhere. It all just seemed a bit off. A huge callback in this installment is a callback to the eighth film, Leatherface. Dante is cut by Leatherface and that injury is the same injury that a young Leatherface sustains right before he makes it home. And this injury is the start to him wearing his leather masks. This film might have been better received as a standalone film, like a lot of the installments in this franchise, but they do a good job with paying respect to the original film and all the films in the franchise, while also bringing something new to the table. Texas Chainsaw Massacre earns 3 rainbow skulls out of 5. Now this next film is likely on the bottom of a lot of people's list, but for me, I just liked it. I liked it because of how real it felt. And so my number five slot goes to the third installment, Leatherface, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Now this one ignores part two. It's yet another direct sequel. And so it's interesting to me that they have three in the title. Now this is the first film in the franchise where Toby or Kim didn't write, direct, or produce, but Kim was actually a creative consultant. For this one, we had Jeff Burr, David Sho, and Robert Engelman as director, writer, and producer, respectively. It stars Kate Hodge, Ken Forey, and Viggo Mortensen. In this sequel, we have two friends who come across the Sawyers when they stop at a gas station and are chased by Tex and his pickup truck. They come across another traveler, Benny, and try to escape the grasp of the family, who is now much bigger than in the previous film. Now we have Tex, Mama, Tinker, a creepy little girl, Leatherface, and a deceased grandpa. There were so many things that I liked about this film. First off, the atmosphere was just right. We're back in isolation in the middle of nowhere, Texas, where it's dusty and woodsy. The previous film had lacked atmosphere, except for maybe when they were in the family's home. And we finally got some melanin inserted into this franchise with Ken Forey, who delivers an excellent performance and really outshines most of the cast. When he ended up being alive at the end, it was the first time in the franchise where I became emotional because he was sincerely a nice dude just trying to help out old girl. The other standout performance was the lead, Kate Hodge as Michelle. I liked her strength from the very beginning and she only becomes stronger throughout the film. She even starts to go a little mad with her cackling at the end, sort of illustrating how one, i.e. this family, can become products of their environment. Michelle's character arc is a fun one to see from a person who could barely 
put an armadillo out of its misery to killing a human with no hesitation. The family was good and creepy. The mother's voice box was fun, and the little girl was perfectly evil. It really got me wanting a movie that was from the family's perspective, which we don't get until the eighth installment. Again, we get a lot of callbacks to the previous films in the franchise, as well as other horror films. Psycho was referenced again with a Peeping Tom scene. We get a leap out of water similar to that of Friday the 13th, and a few more. A few TCM callbacks would be when the gas attendant is trying to sell a Polaroid to our lead actress and the person warning the group from the danger is actually involved and running through the woods. However, at the end, there were too many one-liners that got to be a little bit annoying and the music was a bit much and it seemed like it was trying too hard. And despite this movie being named after Leatherface, we don't really get too much of him and he's just really unmemorable throughout the film. Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 earned three rainbow skulls. Number four on my list is the remake, released in 2003, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Producing again is Kim Hinkle, Toby Hooper, Michael Bay, and Mike Fleiss, with director Marcus Nespel and writer Scott Kosar, who wrote The Machinist, a masterpiece. This one stars Jessica Biel, Jonathan Tucker, Eric Balfour, Mike Vogel, and R. Lee Ermey. The story is almost the same as in the original film, except this time the group is traveling to go to a Leonard Skinner concert and pick up some party favors in Mexico. The hitchhiker this time is someone who has just experienced the wrath of the cannibal family and offs herself when she notices the group heading to the place she has just escaped from. From there, the group is killed off one by one by Leatherface and is tormented by fake Sheriff Hoyt. Because the filmmakers didn't want too many comparisons with the first film, they opted for a more stylized look instead of the gritty documentary style in the first film. And what they got is a beautiful cinematic look. The camera movement was fun and exciting, especially when they were driving. They didn't necessarily go for the documentary style, but at times it did feel like we were right there with them because of the constantly moving camera. Even though TCM didn't technically need a remake, I'm always down to see what a director can do if there is one. They did a really good job of recreating this story and modernizing it while making it their own. We get the staples of the first film with some good gore detours. And the music was epic. This was a good entry into the franchise despite despite its downfalls. There's a little bit of dragging in the middle when the group of friends are waiting around at the farm for the sheriff and end up having to look for each other. This is another film where the characters' reactions weren't so believable all the time, which really took me out of the experience. I mentioned earlier that this Leatherface reminded me of the first Leatherface, but that wasn't until this movie's prequel. In this film, I didn't quite get that feeling. In this film, he's just a big brute without the sensitivity. And speaking of the prequel, they should have made the prequel with the hitchhiker in this film and showed us how she ended up walking in the middle of the road, almost getting hit by Jessica Biel and friends. This film was a good effort and receives three rainbow skulls out of five. Now we're getting up to the top three, and I'm sure a lot of y'all are wondering, where in the hell is the seventh installment, Texas Chainsaw 3D released in 2013? Well, it's going here, at my number three spot. I know it's a bit of an unpopular opinion to dig this film, but I do. This is the fourth direct sequel to the film produced by Toby Hooper, Taro Mazacone, and Mark Berg, and is directed by John Lusenhop and written by Adam, Marcus, and Deborah Sullivan. In this one, Heather and inherits a fortune, not knowing her cousin Leatherface would be part of the package deal. When she arrives in Texas with her friends, as expected, they are killed off one by one. But by the end, she sympathizes with Leatherface, after learning the townspeople and police attempted to murder her entire family decades ago. Right away I'm reminded of Halloween Kills, with the flashbacks to the last scene of the first film and the flash forward to present day. That opening scene got me so excited for the rest of the film. Photos were a lot of fun and just everything about it was perfect. We had the townspeople burning down and shooting out the Sawyer's home, who we didn't feel at all bad for, except for maybe when we hear the baby crying, who obviously survives. The townspeople are clearly no angels either, so we have two sides going at it, with an audience likely cheering for neither side. We sympathize with Sheriff Hooper, 
played by Tom Barry, who's the only one with some common sense and morals. We finally got some more melanin in the franchise. Matter of fact, we got two. Bam, we also got us some Trey songs. So when we flash forward to present day, we have Heather who was the baby that we saw survive the attack. And she's the only person that we care about in this movie. The writers set us up to hate everybody but Heather. So when her line of thinking starts to shift, we almost want to shift with her and sympathize with her and Leatherface. Her friends suck, the townspeople suck, the law sucks, even the lawyer who was trying to help her out sucks. So when Heather starts to feel alone, it makes sense that she would side with her blood, despite his homicidal tendencies. And speaking of of the law in all of these movies whenever a cop is represented they aren't shown in a positive light there are never any good guys in the film besides the final girl which adds to this sense of isolation and helplessness one line that really cracks me up hard was when the mayor tells the cop it's okay it didn't happen when he accidentally shoots the girl in the freezer so we get our freezer and our hook moments again along with some other callbacks the 3d effects do look like pretty bad CGI effects from time to time, but I bet it looks pretty cool with 3D glasses on and in the theater. One thing that really, really bugged me though was when the group leaves the hitchhiker at the mansion by himself. That is just the dumbest thing that nobody would do. But they probably wanted the four friends to hang out a bit before getting attacked, and this was the only way to have an extra person let out Leatherface as well as have the hitchhiker character, who had to surprise us in some way like they've done in previous films. Films. There were some things that bugged me from time to time about the cinematography, but after the first act, I wasn't having those thoughts anymore. I can see why a lot of people wouldn't like this film, but I just really liked this concept and new direction. And the opening was just so killer. If we could ignore reality just a little bit, the follow-up to this movie would have been even more fun. But filmmakers saw this as another fail, so they did not continue this storyline. Texas Chainsaw 3D gets three and a half rainbow skulls. And here comes another unpopular opinion. I bet a lot of y'all are sitting there thinking, please don't let her put Leatherface in front of TCM, the original, please don't. Don't worry, I'm not. It's here at number two. But I really, really enjoy Leatherface and I could be a little bit biased because of Lily Taylor, but man, she rocked it. And the whole cast was just really amazing. Released in 2017, we have another prequel, but this time it's a prequel for the original. And it's set in the mid 60s, 10 years after Jackson, Leatherface, was taken by authorities and admitted into a youth psychiatric hospital because he killed Officer Hal Hartman's daughter. His mother, Verna, caused a riot at the hospital that allowed Jackson and his best friend to escape with fellow patients, a couple, who turned out to be homicidal psychopaths and kidnapped one of the nurses. The group is then hunted down by Officer Hartman who was killing anyone who has escaped the hospital, not just Jackson. Produced by Toby Hooper and Cara Mazzucone again and others, this one is written by Seth M. Sherwood and directed by Julian Mori and Alexander Bustillo. Starring in this one is Lily Taylor, Stephen Dorff, Sam Strike, and Sam Coleman. This is another entry with a really great atmosphere. It's dusty, rugged, warm, orange, and country. The cinematography is beautiful and up close and personal. I think the whole idea for this prequel was a good one and well written from beginning to end. The twist at the end, revealing the smaller guy as Leatherface instead of the bigger guy was quite the surprise. I can understand people complaining about this boy not being big enough to be Leatherface in the future, but he's still under 18, and the male body can really grow a lot between 18 and 30. And because he's likely depressed and suffering from other mental illnesses, it would be easy for him to put on a lot of weight, sitting around at home, eating and following mama's orders but he could have been just a bit taller. They maybe did this twist because of the feedback from the previous sequel with people saying they already knew what was going to happen. So they decided to figure out a way to throw us for a loop. The film maybe should have been called The Sawyers since we don't even know who Leatherface is until the very end. And here we finally get the perspective of the family after eight movies. 
A few of the callbacks in this one are running through the woods, falling through a false floor, and the family dinner. And again, we've got cops getting shown in a terrible light. The only quote-unquote good guy is the nurse who was trying to escape the whole ordeal. As the film goes on, it becomes easy to sort of sympathize with the Sawyers because of their love of family and togetherness. We see how hard Verna loves and fights for her family and her conviction makes us want to side with them. And maybe also because we want to see more of the family at work, collecting people off of the country road. But one big thing that did bug me was when three people hid inside a steer. That was a little far-fetched for a film that was really grounded in reality. Other than that, I don't really have any other complaints about this movie. I really wish there was a third film that was still set before the first film, but unfortunately it stops here. Leatherface earns four Rainbow Skulls out of five. And finally, the number one spot goes to the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, released in 1974. Directed and produced by Toby Hooper and written by Toby Hooper and Kim Hinkle. If you don't already know, in this story, we have two couples and Franklin traveling to go check on the grave of Franklin and Sally's grandfather. When they go to their family's old home, one of the couples takes off and stumbles upon the cannibal family that lives in the woods. Sally's boyfriend goes to look for them and never returns, leaving Sally and her brother Franklin to fend for themselves. And with the keys missing, they have no way to escape. It stars Marilyn Burns, Paul A. Pertain, Jim Siddell, and Gunnar Hansen, who played Leatherface. Even though Leatherface was big and hulking, we had moments where he would cower to the old man, who was half his size, which gives us an idea of the kind of abuse he may be the victim of himself. We also get the idea that he's probably fairly young. Leatherface also shows us his softer side when he puts on makeup for dinner. Toby's inspiration for coming up with this gruesome tale came from the true story of serial killer Ed Gain, as well as the news. He was fed up with being lied to by the media, who would at the same time show really graphic content. While inspired by it, we didn't get too much graphic content on screen as far as the kills go. The film got audiences creeped out and hiding their eyes behind their hands without really showing any of the kills on screen. The atmosphere was hot, dirty, and gritty, which wasn't too difficult to capture given the conditions of the set. It was hot, with temperatures of over 100 degrees. It was cramped, and real bones and rotting meat were used. The film was made on a really low budget, so resources were limited, but they did an amazing job with costumes, effects, and set design. The attention to detail was appreciated, for instance the dirt under the hitchhiker's nails, or Sally's slowly bleeding cut on her head after jumping out of the window. At the time, Toby was doing a lot of documentary work as a cameraman, so he decided to incorporate that style into this film, which really gave it a fly on the wall vibe. We were right there with the characters, watching closely as they were captured one by one. The movie opens with some pretty graphic imagery, quickly setting the tone for the film. I've always liked voiceover news reports like this one because it helps us to get into the action a lot quicker without having to have a long setup. We figure out that some pretty crazy stuff is going down in this area and these kids are walking right into the middle of it willingly. Here are a couple of my standout moments in the film. First is the first kill. Leatherface bashes Kirk's head in, which seems like forever for poor Kirk, who ends up having a seizure as he's being killed. When he's finally dead, the door slam of the metal door, along with the music, was such a moment. It was then we knew we were going to be in for a good and messed up ride. Another one is when Pam walks into the kitchen and sees all of the horrible things lying around. This shocking reveal didn't need camera tricks or crazy transitions. The close-ups, the imagery, and the music were enough to disorient us just like Pam was. The tension is constantly being built throughout the film. One example is Pam's back being exposed and our eyes constantly being drawn to it. It's hard not thinking about what could happen to a girl's exposed back in a movie with the word massacre in the title. And sure enough, her back gets a hook right through it. And this event becomes a staple in the franchise that we see many times. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre was a turning point for slasher films without having to show all the gore. The set design, the atmosphere, and the tension really made for a visceral experience. 
the OG Texas Chainsaw Massacre earns four and a half rainbow skulls out of five. Well, there you have it, folks, my ranking of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. Let me know down below what your ranking list looks like or give me your top three films in the franchise. Well, thank you again for joining me today, fellow Stardust. I appreciate you being here with me. And hopefully I see you this Saturday at the double feature screening in the Mutant Theater, or I'll see you at the premiere of my review of Bad Milo. So, if you haven't already, go ahead and hop on the Rainbow Fright Freight Train and hit that subscribe button along with the notification bell. That way you'll get notified every time I upload a new video. I hope I see you next time. Peace.